Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be going over chapter 32 of the American pageant titled The Great Depression and the New Deal from 1933 to 1939. As always, we're going to be using the 16th edition of the American pageant. If you have an earlier or later edition or a completely different textbook, don't worry about it. The content's going to be the same. So to start off, let's talk about key concepts or rather lack thereof. Obviously, I don't put in key concepts anymore because of copyright, but if you do want to reference the key concepts, they should be located at the beginning of every chapter. At least that's how it is in the American pageant. And I highly recommend you do reference them at least once because it really helps with organizing information and it can be super helpful for sort of getting you to recall information quickly on the AP exam. And overall, I just think it's a great resource to use, so I definitely recommend using it. So to start off, let's talk about Franklin D. Roosevelt, also known as FDR, and specifically how his New Deal policies are going to help bring the U.S. out of the Great Depression and also the generational impacts that these policies will have. And throughout the chapter, you should definitely be keeping note of the effectiveness of these policies because they are effective to an extent, and it's really something that the AP exam likes to tackle, so definitely make note of that as well. But first, let's get into FDR's background, um, both as a politician and as a person. And really, right before he became president, he was the governor of New York, and he was nominated as the Democratic candidate for the election of 1932. Republicans, meanwhile, nominate Hoover again, who, remember, at the time was president, who promised that the worst of the Depression was over and again expressed his support for big business, which made him further lose trust among the public. So with everything that's happened, Hoover, who now has a really tarnished reputation with the public because of his rugged individualist policies and not giving them the direct welfare they needed at the time, going and further expressing his support for big business is not going to really do anything to reassure the American people, especially when, you know, all he really has to prove for himself are, oh, well, you know, it's going to be over soon. So that really isn't enough to convince the American people, which is why at this critical moment in history, FDR wins the election of 1932. In general, there isn't really much you need to know about FDR as a person other than that he was from a wealthy family, he suffered from polio, and these experiences combined humbled him and taught him tolerance and patience. He also had a very conciliatory personality, which was very important for the role he was being put in, you know, when America is really struggling and people are nervous about the future. And his optimism gave this disheartened American public hope for a better future and reassured them that everything was going to be okay at one point or another. You should also know about um, FDR's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, who played a significant role in his political campaigns and joined various organizations like the Women's League and worked in settlement houses. And overall, you see that her empathy for the struggling public further reassures people that FDR would work with the public's interest in mind. So again, we're seeing a very stark contrast in rhetoric between Hoover and FDR. Hoover is about big business. He thinks that if big business thrives, the benefits would ultimately trickle down to the people. Whereas FDR believes that, you know, despite whatever character building may come of facing these hardships, right now the American pe people can't do much um, in terms of giving themselves relief and really need the government aid that only the president and related powers can provide. So really people are reassured by how he's going to be using his power in office. And essentially, all of this is really the base for the New Deal philosophy, which aimed to solve Depression-era problems by providing relief to the unemployed and building on Progressive-era reforms to expand on the welfare state, which, you know, is a relatively new concept at the time. So now they're starting to advocate for what is known as the forgotten man, like poor classes, minorities, and they're doing this through highly experimental methods, which can be a bit nerve-wracking because, remember, the country is basically collapsing, as is the rest of the world, and doing these sort of highly con highly experimental rather things can lead to a lot of criticism but ultimately FDR had good intentions and he always worked to reassure the public and part of the reason that uh, the New Deal was as successful as it was was because of the Brain Trust. Essentially, this was the diverse group of FDR's trusted advisors that helped him develop his New Deal programs. Obviously, they weren't as diverse as they you know, would have been by today's standards, but relatively they were diverse because of the um, very historic appointment of Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins for the first women to ever be in a U.S. presidential cabinet. So already, without even you know making policies, FDR is really making history. But ultimately, the New Deal had three goals, and they're basically known as three R's, which is immediate relief during the Depression, 
long-term recovery that would stabilize the fragile economy, and reform that would improve the nation and prevent a similar situation from happening again. So how exactly does FDR go about accomplishing these goals? Well, it really starts with his first 100 days in office, where FDR has Congress pass a bunch of remedial laws to resolve the current emergency, giving him a significant amount of power to make sweeping, progressive reforms. So, you know, in general, the country is placing a lot of power and faith in FDR's abilities, which, as we'll see later, um, will be seen as problematic among some people. And as soon as he becomes president, FDR starts with a bank holiday, where banks across the nation were forced to close until they could be formally open on a sound basis. FDR further reassures the American public with his fireside chats, essentially he talks to them through the radio, and ensures that essentially banks will only open when they are stable. And ultimately, the fireside chats were a way for people to gain more confidence in banks, which then led them to put money back in them and then further help rebuild the banks. So it's sort of like a cycle, right? The banks have to provide some sort of guarantee that they are somewhat stable. People will invest money in them and then they further stabilize. And ultimately, you know, the idea is that the economy will go back to how it's supposed to be. You should also know about the Emergency Banking Relief Act of 1933. This gave the president power to regulate banking transactions, foreign exchange, and reopen the banks after the holiday was over. So ultimately, this again shows how the president's power has drastically increased because people are so desperate. Um, think of it like, you know, during wartime, we talk about how civil liberties are often reduced and, you know, things like the First Amendment and um, other rights that are our constitutional rights sometimes are suppressed because it's for the sake of the greater good and for just making sure that America is united during a war effort. So the Great Depression is a very similar type of thing um, in regards to an attack on the nation. Like the, the nation is in chaos right now. So in order to you know make sure that everything goes smoothly, a lot of power is given to the president and um, really the House and the Senate will not do much in the way of objections, at least not right now. You should also know about the Glass-Steagall Banking Act. Um, this established the FDIC, also known as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which insured individual bank deposits and essentially ended the unstable, unregulated banking system that had caused the Great Depression in the first place. So a lot of banking reform immediately. That's basically what he does right as he goes into office. And another priority high on FDR's list is creating jobs for people. Obviously, right now, a lot of people are unemployed, so it naturally makes sense that he would focus on um, getting people jobs that would allow them to make money while also helping the government by, like, you know, having them complete certain jobs. And so this, like, there are a bunch of organizations that he's going to create, which I'll talk about in, like, a minute. But it can be kind of confusing because it's like an alphabet soup. It's literally just a bunch of acronyms, but it is really important that you do remember these. First up, we have the CCC, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps, and it essentially employed jobless men in restoration projects and park maintenance. You also have the FERA, which was the Federal Emergency Relief Act. This gave states direct relief payments that were also used for wages on various work projects that were commissioned by the states. You should also know about the AAA. This was the Agricultural Adjustment Act, and it essentially paid farmers to cut crop production so that the government wouldn't have to worry about a surplus of goods, which kind of seems counterintuitive at first, but ultimately it would be more expensive for the government to you know, keep up with a surplus that wasn't being met by significant demand, especially because people are, you know, don't have a lot of money to spare. So really they're just telling farmers, don't make any food and we'll give you money. Um, and these subsidies help farmers pay off their mortgages. So it was really just a nice little cycle and it sort of worked out for everyone. You should also know about the HOLC, also known as the Homeowners Loan Corps, and it essentially refinanced the homes of struggling middle-class families. But moving on, let's talk about FDR's critics. Obviously, he's been given immense power and not everyone is going to be happy with the way he's using it, um, specifically, you know, conservative voices, but also some liberal ones, too. And in terms of conservative critics, they despise the increased size of the federal government and the extension of their regulatory powers. So they believe that the New Deal was socialist and way too experimental for the chaos um, that the country was in right now. They also dislike the deficit spending, which FDR believed was necessary to stimulate economic growth. 
Meanwhile, you have liberal critics who said that FDR just wasn't doing enough and that his policies should expand to cover a greater um, depth of people than he currently was doing. And most of these critics really became demagogues. Demagogues are essentially politicians who gain power and popularity by distorting problems using emotions and people's prejudices. So they're often, you know, well known for championing the people's cause against aristocrats, but this is often, you know, all about false promises and they don't really care about what they're advocating for. So for example, Hitler was a very well-known demagogue. He claimed to um, champion the people's causes when in reality we know that his intentions were far, far darker than that. So ultimately, demagogues really, they were all talk and didn't do much of anything. For example, you have Francis Townshend who promised the elderly that they would get $600 a month um, if I don't know, he was elected or he came to power somehow. And ultimately, he obviously couldn't follow through with that because $600 at the time was a lot of money, um, especially during a depression. So yeah, it, it was really all talk and not much that they could do in the way of actually helping people. Another demagogue you should know about is Charles Coughlin, who was a Catholic priest that used the radio to preach all of these, you know, things saying that FDR was too friendly to the banks, that he didn't really care about the people, and ultimately his organization was eventually shut down after it became increasingly anti-Semitic and fascist. You should also know about Huey Long, who popularized his Share the Wealth program where every family would receive $5,000 at the expense of the wealthy. So like some of the um, taxes that the wealthy were paying would go directly towards the poor. Obviously this wasn't possible at the time, he didn't really have any power for that, but that was what he advocated for, um, and to some extent it was popular. But really, your key takeaway should be that all of these people frightened Americans by suggesting that there is a link between economic crisis and the rise of fascism domestically. Essentially, they believe that FDR was taking advantage of the fragile nation so that he could eventually rise to power and become dictator, and this fear further intensified when, again, Hitler came to power in Germany. So a lot of people, obviously, you know, to some extent, they are wary of FDR because he has, again, a significant amount of power right now. But FDR is pretty well intentioned during this time, and he's going to use that responsibly. Um, and, you know, sometimes that is obstructed by these critics who think that he will end up being a dictator. But moving on, let's talk about what exactly these New Deal policies were. And I split them up into different categories depending on like who they affected because I think it's a lot easier to remember them that way. So the first one we're going to talk about is industry and labor reform. The first organization that you should know about is the National Recovery Administration, also known as the NRA. This aimed to help industry, labor, and the unemployed with immediate relief and long-term reform. So essentially what they did was they had the industries reduce working hours per person so that they could give more people jobs. So if one person worked like, I don't know, 50 or even more than that hours a week, they would reduce it to maybe 30 so that that work could be spread more evenly across a greater span of people. And you should also note that in general, the labor movement will have a lot of key victories during this time. So for example, they establish a maximum number of working hours per person, a minimum wage, and forbade anti-union contracts. Additionally, workers were given the right to organize and collectively bargain through union representatives of their choosing. So usually what would happen was, you know, all of the unions would have a union representative and that representative would be chosen by the employer. So naturally that representative would be um, representing the employer's interests and trying to find more of a compromise that leaned towards the employer's liking. But now these workers are able to choose a representative who will directly address their needs, which makes sure that you know their demands um, come across and that they get a better compromise that actually helps them. And of course, because of this, big business is getting extremely upset because the federal government is advocating for the working class. And so they're going to retaliate by establishing a bunch of you know, various working uh, codes and regulations. And it's really just representative of the decades long shift that we're seeing from solely you know, helping big business to actually helping the people. Usually what would happen was if there was say a labor strike, um, as we've seen in you know, previous labor strikes, Generally, the government will intervene on the employer's side, but now that's very slowly but surely shifting towards helping the people. But aside from that, you should definitely know about the Supreme Court case Schechter v. U.S. in 1935. This ruled that the NRA was actually unconstitutional because it gave way too much legislative power to FDR and allowed Congress to control individual businesses, not just interstate commerce. So essentially, big business and even some of the public are slightly on edge because of these demagogues and they want to limit FDR's power, but really, they're not actually doing much of anything. 
um, with the Supreme Court case, for example. So although they think, you know, they're super smart, they kind of aren't. And it still shows how, despite the economic crisis, the idea of checks and balances is still being upheld. So although FDR, again, has a bunch of power, he still is going to be checked and sort of kept in line and make sure that he doesn't abuse that power. You should also know about the Public Works Administration, also known as the PWA. This intended to provide long-term recovery by spending $4 billion on 30,000 infrastructure projects like dams, highways, and public buildings. And this is going to be very useful later on, specifically with dams, because it allowed for irrigation of farmland and generated plenty of electricity, which would become essential during World War II. And lastly, you should note that FDR repealed the Prohibition Amendment to help the alcohol industry because the government needed a way to raise revenue and provide more employment opportunities. So obviously at this point, you know, people from the beginning of the amendment um, weren't really taking it seriously. They sort of just went about how they usually drank alcohol, but was a bit more discreet about it. But now FDR is realizing that alcohol is really going to be um, a good source of revenue and sort of prohibiting that isn't going to help anyone, so he ultimately repeals it. But moving on, let's talk about farmer problems and battling big business. In terms of farmers, they're really struggling right now because of the low crop prices. This is due to overproduction, which leads them to farm foreclosures because they aren't able to pay their mortgages. And this leads us to the creation of an organization which we just talked about a few slides back, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, and it attempted to reduce crop surpluses in order to increase crop prices by, again, paying farmers not to farm. And this is obviously a very controversial thing. Um, in fact, the Supreme Court declares that it's unconstitutional in 1936 because its taxation programs were illegal. Additionally, it required the destruction of food, which many people found horrific since a lot of people were starving during the Great Depression. So obviously they didn't want you know, food to be destroyed like that, like it could be given to, um, you know, those who were in need, and really it just was kind of problematic. So now that the AAA isn't going to work anymore, you know, Congress still does want to help farmers, so they respond with the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act of 1936. This reduced crop acreage by paying farmers to plant soil conserving crops. And amidst all of this, farmers and many people in the Trans-Mississippi states are going to have to deal with the Dust Bowl. This was caused by drought, wind, and the overproduction of land, and displaced many families who ended up moving to California as New Deal legislation relieved their burdens, like temporarily suspending mortgage foreclosures. Moving on, let's talk about battling big business. You should know about the Federal Securities Act, which required that people who sell investments must inform investors of any financial risks. So obviously one of the reasons why this depression even started was because people were spending their money um, not as responsibly as they should have and putting investments in really risky businesses. So to ensure that doesn't happen again, people are going to be informed of the risks of their investment to make sure that they're more careful about it. You should also know about the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, which is the SEC. This provided oversight for the stock market and again gave the public more protection against fraud and insider manipulation. But really one of the most important ways FDR tackles um, big business is through the Tennessee Valley Authority, also known as the TVA. This was a project that was started by New Dealers who accused the electric power industry of overcharging the public for electricity. Obviously, this is a major concern right now because um, in the Depression, people do not have money to spare on things like electricity, which could go towards food on the table. So the government decides to investigate this by constructing dams on the Tennessee River to give them information on how much money was required to produce and distribute electricity. And turns out that the TVA power was found to be a lot less costly. Critics of this um, entire project said that it was proof of rising socialism in the US, while companies who were responsible for the overcharging said that it was a result of dishonest bookkeeping. However, it really ultimately turned a poverty-stricken area into a prosperous one and provided employment in the region. So this is definitely a very, very important project you should know about. Okay, next up, let's talk about housing and social security, as well as a couple other labor reforms that you should also know about. In terms of housing, you should know about the Federal Housing Administration, also known as the FHA, in 1934. This gave small loans to homeowners so that they could improve their homes or buy new ones. So again, they're trying to stimulate economic growth by trying to get people to buy things. You should also know about the U.S. Housing Authority, also known as the USHA. This was formed in 1937 and it lent money to states and communities for low-cost housing development. So ultimately, they're trying to reduce the number of slum areas in the U.S., also known as Hoovervilles. They're just trying to make sure that everyone has a safe, hygienic place to live um, for the time being so that people just, you know, aren't um, put in dangerous situations where they aren't able to live. 
really the big act you should know about, in, at least in this category, is the Social Security Act of 1935. This provided insurance for the unemployed and elderly, which was financed by a payroll tax on the employer. And this is very controversial because Republicans are going to see this act as what they call handouts that promoted a cult of leisure, basically saying that people aren't going to work because they receive federal benefits. Obviously, we know now that that's not the case because federal benefits are not enough to you know, sustain a family for an extended period of time, but ultimately they believe that the government was being too liberal and wasting money on what they call useless people. So essentially they're saying, look, if people aren't able to provide for their family on their own, um, you know, even if it's a depression, they should be more responsible with their finances, and if they aren't able to do that, then do we really want to save them? And it's a really messed up mentality, but ultimately they are very against this act. But the reason why this act is so important is because it established the principle of federal responsibility for social welfare, providing support for urbanized Americans who now relied on the unpredictable boom and bust cycle of the economy. So no one really knows whether they can you know, expect a check at the end of the week or whether they can be able to provide um, food for their family. They sort of rely on whatever the economy is like at the time, and no one really has stable jobs, especially farmers. So by relying on the spoon and bust cycle, they're incredibly vulnerable, especially to the sort of um, depre depressions and financial crises that occur every couple of years. So it's really important that they have that sort of backup plan where the government can give them a, you know, a little boost to help them get back on their feet. But moving on, let's talk about labor reforms. You should definitely know about the Wagner Act of 1935. This is essentially considered the Magna Carta of labor reform because it protected the right of labor to organize in unions and again, bargain collectively with employers. A board was also established to monitor unfair labor practices by employers. So clearly employers are being held to a higher standard and they can't just um, exploit their workers to maximize profits. It's really about protecting um, employees and making sure they're cared for and that their demands to some extent are met. You should also know about the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. This regulated the minimum wages and maximum hours that had again been set in the previous act that I talked about a couple slides ago, um, and they essentially focused on interstate commerce workers and also outlawed child labor. However, because it excluded agricultural and service workers, where you know African Americans, Mexican Americans, and women were concentrated, it didn't really benefit as many people as it could have, and you know it was it was helpful, but only to a localized group of people. And finally, for this labor category, you should know about the CIO, also known as the Committee of Industrial Organization. This was a labor union that broke away from the AFL, which, if you remember, was the American Federation of Labor. That was really like the biggest, most interconnected union um, at the, in the nation at the time. And they essentially worked to organize unskilled industrial workers regardless of their economic status or craft. So again, this is another major win for labor. And finally, last slide of the chapter, let's talk about what happens at the end of the Depression. And it really starts with the election of 1936. Republicans choose a guy named Alfred Landon, and Democrats choose FDR. Obviously, he's doing well. He's the president at the time. He's a relatively bipartisan leader, and there hasn't been anything controversial about his presidency. FDR ends up winning because, obviously, he has a wide appeal to the forgotten man, um, which includes some Southerners, Black people, and poor people. However, he is going to lose some of his popularity following a conflict with the Supreme Court. So for a little bit of background, at the time, the Supreme Court was filled with conservative judges who opposed what they called Socialist New Deal reforms. FDR believes that the judges should be more liberal and in line with public opinion. So although he has his own motivations for, you know, having more liberal judges, FDR does want to make sure that the judges are representing the nation's opinion, um, not just their own. And so to do this, he creates a court packing plan in 1937. This allowed him to add a new justice for every sitting justice over 70 years old who wasn't going to retire. And it was very, very, very controversial. Ultimately, both Republicans and Democrats accused FDR of trying to defy the checks and balances system, marking his first political defeat among the public. So obviously, like we talked about, FDR did have his critics. He had um, conservative critics and a couple of demagogues who said he wasn't doing enough. But this is really the first major political defeat because it's such bipartisan criticism, not just coming from um, one side or the other. However, some conservative judges do end up becoming more liberal in order to preserve the Supreme Court as it was. And just as the Depression is starting to die down a bit, a recession occurs in 1937, caused by reduced consumer spending due to social security taxes that cut into payrolls, and the federal government also had to cut down um, on their spending in order to keep a balanced budget. 
And so to prevent this recession from getting worse, FDR adopts Keynesianism. Essentially, this was an economic theory where banks would adjust interest rates and the government would use deficit spending to incentivize people to spend more, which would in turn increase economic prosperity. And because of this, critics of New Dealers said that they were spending too much money and that it was becoming a little suspicious, you know, maybe there was corruption or something. And so to reassure the American public that, you know, nothing bad was happening behind the scenes and that everything that was occurring was legitimate, the Hatch Act is passed to stop corruption, but ultimately it doesn't really do much of anything and it isn't really effective. But really, one of your key takeaways from this chapter should be that although FDR was relatively bipartisan with his reforms, both sides either thought he was doing too little or too much, when in reality, he was just trying to make the best out of a really unprecedented situation. And uh, yeah, that does it for this chapter. Here are the credits for how I got everything you just saw. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below if you have any questions. Please be sure to like, subscribe, all of that. You know the drill. Um, it really helps me out and lets me know that these videos are helpful for you so that I can continue making videos in the future. So uh, yeah, see you in the next video.